So I, I'm Leonie Sandercock, and it's my um, it's my job to to chair the opening session this morning, which is on spaces of exclusion and contestation. Um, so first of all, I would I would like to acknowledge that we're we're here today, thanks to the the generosity of the Musqueam people on whose traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands this <coughs> university sits. Uh, and in particular, our, our school is very privileged to be in a, in a partnership now, in a formal partnership with the Musqueam Nation on, on a new part of our, of our master's degree in Indigenous community planning specialisation. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Leona Sparrow, who's, who's here from Musqueam, who's the Director of Treaty Lands and Resources at Musqueam, and more particularly an adjunct professor now in our school, which we're really delighted about. Musqueam are contributing a lot to our curriculum now. Um, so there are f four of us are gonna, gonna speak for 10 minutes or so this morning on, the, on this topic of, of spaces of exclusion and contestation. Um, and let me introduce the panel. Um, Liana Patrick is a, is a PhD student in our school. She comes to us from a, a master's degree in um, Indigenous Governance at UVic and has a lot of experience working in the Indigenous health field in Vancouver uh, in the Division of Aboriginal Health at UBC and, and beyond. She's been teaching and her work is looking at the intersections um, between uh, Indigenous health and, and specifically around uh, um, mental health and, and addictions issues and the possibilities of community planning as a way of addressing more holistically some of those challenges for First Nations communities. Um, and Liana's um, doctoral work is, is uh, focused on the downtown east side. So, so part, of our, part of our panel today is on the topic of Indigenous Vancouver. And then there's Liana kind of bridges from, from my opening remarks into, uh, into the downtown east side. And we have two seasoned warriors of, the, of east side Vancouver here today to share their experience and accumulated wisdom. Um, Matt Hearn, um, some of you might know from SFU, from Cape Breton University, from his organization Groundswell, um, from his activism, and he's also a sports writer, he tells me. Um, Nathan Edelson is an adjunct professor in our school. He was the former senior planner in the downtown east side of Vancouver for longer than he wants to admit um, and did amazing work uh, introducing collaborative approaches, bringing, bringing people together who previously had refused to be in the same room. So his, his actual experience and accomplishments in community planning and economic development planning in the downtown east side are really, um, uh, our students get to learn from that experience. Um, I guess I, sh I should just say that we're, I guess the purpose of today and, and all of the panels today is that our school is um, intending to produce a book about uh, a critical take on, on Vancouver planning. And we're trying to do this in a, in a kind of collaborative way with, with SCARP faculty collaborating with adjunct professors, with PhD students, uh, or with community partners. So um, in, in that spirit, uh, the original plan for the Indigenous of Vancouver piece of, of today was that um, Musqueam would be co-presenting with us. And, and Musqueam have, um, do, do actually want to contribute um, to the what ends up hopefully as a chapter of the book. But things are very busy at, at Musqueam right now and, and the folks that want to be involved um, didn't have the time to, to sort of focus on today. So um, Liana and I have agreed to be the placeholders, so to speak, for, for, for what might emerge. Um, so I would just, just like to sketch a little, a little bit of what I think is, is kind of the essential first chapter of, of such a book. Which is, um, which, which is to acknowledge um, the indigenous realm that was here long before Vancouver was, was here. Um, and I guess I'd like to kind of get from 10,000 years ago to the present and towards the, the, 
the question of uh, a more just coexistence with Indigenous peoples in the space of 10 minutes. So um, this is necessarily going to be very sketchy and all over the place. But I, w I, I, I have in mind maybe, maybe four different pieces of a, uh, of a, of a chapter that, that necessarily has to start with what um, Musqueam people have to tell us about, about their life ways, about their forms of governance, their traditional uh, forms of, of planning, what we would call indigenous planning that existed long before Europeans set foot in, in this part of the world. Uh, so I think the, the, the first part of any piece would be um, the pre-contact story of, of Musqueam and, and other sovereign nations and how, how they lived in this part of the world that we now call um, Metro Vancouver. Um, the, the second part of the story, I think, has to then look at the impact of urban settlement on, on those previously sovereign nations. <coughs> and, <coughs> pardon me, to look at the idea of urban settlement as part of a nation building project that was inherently um, a colonization project. Um, and the, the, the result of which was the dispossession of those previously sovereign indigenous nations. So the urban settlement project um, as, as part of colonization was also linked to the, the main um, tools of colonization in the 19th century beginning in the 1840s, 1850s, um, with, with the reserve system of Indian lands, which um, I think we would want to argue is actually the first planning. The first planning that happens in what's now known as British Columbia was done by those colonial administrators um, in, in setting out the reserve system, which confined um, Native people to minuscule portions of their former territories and, and basically uh, di uh, stole not just their land but their, their life ways, their, their economy. Um, and Cole Harris has written a, a wonderful book about that, uh, making, making Native Space. Um, while the reserve system was being implemented in its various iterations from, eight, from the 1850s all the way through to the 1930s as reserves continued to be laid out, including the urban reserves, the Indian Act of 1876 was, kind of the, was the next piece of, of, of dispossession of indigenous peoples in, in turning them from formerly sovereign nations to wards of the state. Um, so when we get to the founding of Vancouver that we like to, to sort of celebrate as part of settler history, when we, when we get to the 1880s and to, to 1886, um, that the founding of, of Vancouver as, a, as well, the beginnings of Vancouver as a city, uh, as the location of the, of the rail terminus, so it coincides with the launching of a public discourse um, coincides but is not a coincidence the, with the launching of a public discourse around what um, Professor Evelyn Peters um, has called the impossible contradiction. And that is from the 1880s onwards, the, the, the settler discourse was that there was no place for Indigenous peoples in the city, that, that this was an impossible contradiction, that Indigenous peoples were primitive and cities were modern and the two did not go together. Um, so I quote you from, from an editorial in the province newspaper that expresses this rather well. A city is no place for the primitive wards of the government. An Indian reserve in the midst of a big city is an anachronism. Um, the urban reserves that had begun to be laid out in the 1860s, like the, the 80 acre Kitsilano reserve, those reserves from the 1880s onwards became coveted by by settlers, by businessmen, and by various branches of the government, from, from the harbour people to the ports people to the, to the parks people. Um, and, and so successive acts of what we might call public policy violence um, over the next decades are, are basically attempts to remove Indigenous peoples from the, from the urban area. Um, 
Prime Minister Laurier am amending the Indian Act in 1911, uh, I quote, where a reserve is in the vicinity of a growing town, it becomes a source of nuisance and an impediment to progress. Thus, residents of any Indian reserve which adjoins or is situated in an existing town with a population of 8,000 people or more could be legally removed without their consent if it was deemed in the public interest. And there's that, that well-known planning concept of the public interest and, um, uh, and, and the use of that concept to, to remove certain peoples who are regarded as not belonging, not desirable. Um, so what uh, the historian at, at University of Victoria, Jordan Stanger Ross, calls the, the age of municipal colonialism, sort of began in the 1880s when, when municipalities in the lower mainland um, begin to see the urban reserves as a nuisance and begin to covet those lands and to start eating away at them, to start want, wanting to make, to make claims on them, to, to, to remove pieces or entire reserves uh, and turn them into uh, parks, industrial sites, uh, residential subdivisions. The 80-acre Kitsilano Reserve, for example, in the first decade of, of the 20th century, came under enormous pressure from, from the province and the city um, for the, the indigenous peoples living on that reserve uh, to sell. Um, they were basically told that if they didn't agree to sell, they'd be kicked out anyway without any compensation. Um, and they were eventually evicted in 1913 in a very, um, in a very brutal way, shipped off, taken off on, on barges. Um, the, the houses, gardens, belongings burned as the barges sailed away. Um, similarly, Stanley Park was a much coveted uh, Stanley Park, which had been inhabited for thousands of years by uh, by Indigenous peoples, was um, in 1908 handed over by the Feds to to the city of Vancouver. was was coveted as a park. The people who'd been living there uh, all of that time, uh, the, the pressure started to be put on them. They began to be evicted through the 1920s. Uh, into the into the 1930s, uh, when they um, when when those people requested a reserve to be made, um, uh, they were the, they were told that they, that they had no claim to the land and that Native Indians have no idea of time. So the case that that, that they were making about their inhabitation of the area was was sort of deemed to be ridiculous because. Um, they had no sense of time. Um, and, and, and just another final example of, of the, the way that, that public policy and, and planning uh, served to, to uh, attempted to erase Indigenous peoples from the, the metropolitan area. The Bartholomew Plan, the much lauded Bartholomew Plan, one of the, the founding fathers of, of uh, modern scientific planning, Bartholomew was brought here from the US. His 1929 plan um, deemed all of the existing urban reserves uh, that the future of those reserves would be they would make superb parkland. There was no mention of the people living on the reserves or what might happen to them. All of those reserves were, in his plan, um, going to be going to be turned into parkland. The Musqueam Reserve um, was seen as particularly particularly appropriate for a scenic promenade and for a, for a sports arenas. Um, so in, in the face of this <clears throat> onslaught to their territories, um, the, the Musqueam, the Squamish, the, the Tsleil-Waututh, the, the other nations of the Lower Mainland, have, they've, they've confronted, they've rejected this discourse of the impossible contradiction. Um, they're still here, um, they're, they're fighting, and there, are, there have been shifts in the political landscape in the last 20, 30 years, um, particularly um, in 1982 with the new constitution and with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, that constitution acknowledges Aboriginal rights and title um, and yet there's been a legal vacuum ever since in actually specifying what that means which puts the burden on nations like Musqueam to go to court, to litigate, to establish bit by bit and step by step what those rights are and how to get title. We have a treaty process, as you know, 
uh, that is moving at, 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 at glacial pace. So while we talk, and we talked a lot last year about, about reconciliation, um, I think reconciliation means a lot more than, than you know, walking together and acknowledging the damage done by residential schools. I think re reconciliation is impossible without a recognition of, of the need for, for land justice. Um, so, in short, the urban region that we now inhabit and, and call Metro Vancouver is, is an ongoing frontier of contestation um, between uh, Indigenous peoples and the, the Canadian state, which is the, the province um, and, and the federal government. And, and so increase, we're, we're seeing two things, I think. We're, we're seeing, on the one hand, increasing conflict so, for example, last, last night um, the panellists were talking about um, the, the sort of shock horror of the Sawasan First Nations plans to build a mega mall and, and how, how terrible is this. Um, so, there's, so there's conflict between you know, settler ideas and Western planning ideas of what's good planning and what the Sawasan First Nation believes it needs to do in terms of economic development given a very constricted land base. There was conflict a few years ago when the Squamish uh, talked about putting billboards uh, at the entrance of, of Parade Bridge. It was another kind of shock horror. This is not the Vancouver we know and love. Um, but what was the Squamish perspective on that? Why were they doing that? What are, what are their needs for economic development? Um, um, two years ago, 2012, Musqueam people spent 200 and something days um, peacefully protesting at, at, the, at the Siznam site, the site of their ancient village and sacred site. One minute. Um, uh, in response to the, the shocking actions of both the city of Vancouver and the province uh, in, in approving condominium development. Um, I asked myself, what were those, what was that dozen or so planners in the city of Vancouver doing? What, what were they thinking when they simply ticked off the development applications. You know, what, what did they know or what did they not know about Aboriginal rights and title, about the duty to consult and so on. Um, well, to finish on a, a little bit of a, an optimistic note, the city of Vancouver um, last year did appoint its first Aboriginal planner. Um, it did declare the year of reconciliation. It did uh, uh, reach a, a service agreement with, uh, with Musqueam earlier this year. Um, this, is, this is perhaps a good sign of the opening up of a dialogue that, that sorely needs to happen. Um, in, in the last week, we've read in the paper about a, a sort of a historic land deal that has happened where the province has, has sold land to a partnership of, of several First Nations in, in, uh, in collaboration with the Aquilini group and to the horror of the of the city of Burnaby and the, the mayor of Burnaby who felt completely left out of the process. So it's kind of refreshing that the, the, the a municipal government suddenly feels that it's being excluded. Um, but not to joke about that, I think what, what, what's the, the challenge for planning now and in the future and, and part of the reason we have this new Indigenous Community Planning Program is to find ways of working, of working together for, of municipalities and their, their neighbouring nations and there are very few munis municipalities so far who have figured out how to even start that conversation. Um, so I, I think it, that's our challenge, is to understand what Aboriginal rights and title means in urban areas like, like the metro region and to begin to think through um, uh, the, the issue of land justice. Thanks very much. Um, Liana. <laughs>